remarks from those who are with us on stage here. Uh, each will offer a brief reflection. Then we will open it up for a brief Q&A period that will be moderated. And then we'll wrap things up. We probably will not have time for uh, individual one-on-ones following this uh, immediately because we will have a 4 p.m. Uh, briefing with the Inuit delegates. So some introductions. To my left is President Cassidy, Cassidy Caron, who is the president of the Métis National Council. Next to Cassidy, we have Mitchell Case, member of the delegation. Next to Mitchell is Pixie Wells, another member of the Métis delegation. Next to Pixie, we have Archbishop Donald Bolin, who is the Archbishop of Regina. And next to Archbishop Bolin, we have Bishop Raymond Poisson, who is the president of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. So once again, a welcome to you all. And with that, I'll hand things over to President Carroll. Thank you. Tanse uh, Kiowao. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Cassidy Karen. I am Métis. My family comes from St. Louis and Batoche, Saskatchewan. I am a very proud Métis woman and the president of the Métis National Council. I am truly honored to be here with all of you today, uh, to be alongside some of my, my colleagues, my community members, and to be surrounded by our elders and residential school survivors from the Métis Nation, but also our, our colleagues and our relatives from the Assembly of First Nations and Inuit Tapirik Kanatami. It's truly an honor for us to be all together working towards reconciliation for our people. So today, uh, the Métis National Council, we had a, a delegation of eight official delegates uh, met with Pope Francis. And uh, it was our intention in that meeting to really uphold and elevate our survivors. And so we had three really incredibly brave and resilient survivors who came with us and they shared their truths with Pope Francis. And uh, those were just three of the many, many stories from our residential school survivors. And it was a, it was a powerful moment for our survivors to be able to share those truths with Pope Francis. We, as a Métis Nation, have extended an invitation to Pope Francis to join us on our path for truth, healing, justice, and reconciliation. Each of those, those words are so meaningful, and each of those have so many actions that need to follow in order to move towards building a brighter, better, healthier, sustainable, prosperous Métis Nation for our future generations so that we can work to heal intergenerational trauma and that this will never happen again. One of the things that uh, we really wanted to extend to Pope Francis is that this is about our children. One of our, our survivors is very adamant in sharing that these atrocities that happened at residential schools to our Métis survivors, this happened to children. And that is no, never okay. And we need to do all that we can to protect our children because those are our future generations. So those were some of the messages that we shared with Pope Francis today. We know that reconciliation is a long journey and it's going to take commitment and action from so many people. It's going to take action from Canadians. It's going to take action from the government. It's going to take action from churches, parishioners, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Catholic Church as a whole, and the Pope. And there's a role to play for everybody in our healing and our reconciliation journey. And so today we extended that invitation to the Pope and to all of you to join us on our path for truth, reconciliation, healing, and justice. And I look forward to the path that we are going to walk when we go home. This is just one step forward in our journey. Reconciliation did not begin today with a, with a meeting with Pope Francis, and it doesn't end here either. This is just one stepping stone on that journey, and we hope that there will be commitment from all of those folks that I just named, including the, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. We have talked at length about how we can continue this work in Canada with their leadership alongside of us. We can commit to meetings on a regular basis where we can establish priorities 
the priorities that come from our communities, and we can continue to move forward. And uh, out of this, we, we do hope that there will be concrete action. We hope that the Pope heard our stories, that he acknowledges and truly understands that he translates those stories from his head to his heart and then into action. So we look forward to the additional response that we will have from Pope Francis on Friday at the general audience, as well as, as whatever he intends to do when he does come and visit us in Canada. And we know that when he does come to visit us in Canada, that he will know some of those stories from the Métis Nation, and that's exactly what we intended to do today. So we're, we're happy for ourselves. We, we, we knew this work had to be done. We've done the work to listen to many of our survivors and deliver that message. And, and uh, we're here to support one another, and that's exactly what we're doing. So. Thank you so much to all of you for helping to share our stories. This is really, really important to us and uh, just really looking forward to seeing how the rest of this week goes. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch Case. I'm the uh, regional councillor for the Huron Superior Regional Métis Community on the Provisional Council of the Métis Nation of Ontario, and I'm part of the Métis National Council delegation. One of the one of the delegates uh, that that had the meeting with uh, with Pope Francis uh, this morning. Uh, I guess that I just wanted to provide just a few a few comments, uh, mostly um, the the how incredibly overwhelmed I am by the amazing amazing strength and resilience of those those three survivors those but those three survivors being uh, representative of and emblematic of uh, many 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 more at home and uh, and I just I cannot say enough uh, about Angie and Anne and Emil and how incredibly uh, uh, I, I I have three new uh, never mind Marvel and their universe. Those superheroes are right there in that room this morning who stood up and told the truth. And they told hard truths. And, and, they, and they did it with kindness and they did it with love and they did it with respect. Um, but they told the truth. And, and I think that that, uh, I just cannot say enough, enough about how amazingly inspiring uh, those survivors are. But I, 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 would, I would then say... In, in many ways, uh, the, the opportunity for those three survivors to speak this morning, unfortunately, has been in, in many ways the first time any Métis survivors have been invited to say anything. Uh, the, the, the exclusion of Métis schools from the settlement agreement uh, a decade ago, uh, the uh, exclusion of Métis survivors and Métis schools from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, has done nothing other than re-victimize and re-traumatize people uh, to, uh, to have officially, uh, have it essentially officially to be told that what happened at one school was, was, was wrong. But if it happened at another school and at the end of the day some other government paid for it, well then it was okay. And I don't agree. I do not agree it was okay. It, what happened was a crime against humanity, and, and it happened to our survivors, it happened to our children. And, and that, um, that is, quite frankly, the unfinished business uh, that, is, that is happening here. You know, there is a whole lot of unfinished business uh, that we as, as Métis people and Métis communities have uh, with Canadian society. And, uh, and I think uh, today, Today was an opportunity for those three survivors uh, to, to bring their story forward, not only to Pope Francis, but to the world. And, and I want to commend, uh, commend the media here for, for paying attention uh, to, to the Métis Nation in a way that, most frankly, uh, quite frankly, most often doesn't happen. And uh, I, 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 commend, I commend you for, 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 for that. I would close... Uh, by saying, you know, we, we are committed uh, to, you know, as, as elected leadership, 
the one thing we can all agree on, and, and anyone who knows any elected official in any government in any part of the world, is there are very few things we all agree on. But there is one thing we agree on, is that we stand behind those survivors 100%. And we'll do whatever we can to get justice for them. And so I, I, my message uh, today would be that we are, uh, we are going to, uh, today is, is simply the beginning of something. Um, but I would close, uh, I would close my comments uh, with a message to the Canadian media and to the Canadian government uh, that the, and uh, to the Canadian and the provincial governments who operated those Métis schools, that th that, that process was largely, I mean, let's be real. Those residential schools were set up to remove us from the land so that Canada could claim everything. And here we are, a century and a half later, with still no process. No process for our, our survivors to tell their story. No process for anyone to say sorry. No, no process for anyone to say what happened was wrong. And at the end of the day, Canada still has all the land and there's not even a process for us to talk to them about it. And that is, quite frankly, unacceptable. And so I, I would say, I have read uh, journals of, of priests in the, in the 1800s as they stood there and watched script speculators steal land from Métis people all across Western Canada. I know the role that the priests played in the theft of my, my community's lands in Sault Ste. Marie. I would call on the, on, the, on the Catholic Church to stand with us today as we seek justice for, for all of those other issues that were enabled and facilitated because of residential schools. So I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, and I, I thank uh, President Karen for, uh, for this opportunity this afternoon. Tansi, the Shinnekashun, Pixie Wells, um, Ace Wells. So what I've said to you is, hello, my name is Pixie Wells, and uh, Ace Wells is in the language and where I come from. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional unceded territories that I reside on. I live in a town called Abbotsford, and uh, the traditional unceded territory there is owned by the Samath and Mathaque people. And I want to acknowledge that. And I am also the, the pr president of the Fraser Valley Métis Association. I come here today um, holding up survivors, but I also come here today um, with a voice of the lost children and the children that have been lost. And, I, and I, the survivors today um, gave me such a warm feeling and um, understanding that their stories and where they came from and how we got here and where, why we're in this room today. And why we're in this room today is because of those specific survivors and those ones that told their stories. And not just those three, there's many, many more. There's more stories and more stories. However, um, those stories are never to be forgotten. They are what we should prove or live to never let happen again and also allow the voices of the lost children, the children that never got to be or never got to know their culture because that's where I sit. At 40 years old, I learned that I was Métis. So I am still trying to figure out where I sit in this world, how I fit into this world, and what piece of it that I can bring forward. And the piece that I bring forward is holding those those survivors and, and taking their stories with me. And also when I met the Pope today at looking at tomorrow and looking at what we could create together and bringing back the voice of all children, the two spirit, the LGBTQQIA+, as I sit here, that voice has been lost for a very, very long time. And that is why I dressed the way I did today is to show that the two-spirited people are still here and we've been discommunicated from a lot of our communities and shunned and pushed aside and not from survivors, just from the, uh, the atrocities that happened. So I ask that all of you take a really good hard look around and make sure that we're holding each and every one of us accountable to truth and reconciliation. We have to have truth first before we can have reconciliation and we need action. And what is the action? Each and every one of us, every one of us in this room can play some part in that action. And I'm not saying that we all have to, but I think that a lot of us need to. And whatever that action is, find something. Find something in your community to do. Because I can tell you, when I leave here today, my job just started. My work just started for my people. 
Because when I go home, I'm going to be asking and I'm going to be looking not just at the government, not just, not just at the Métis Nation BC, but also holding my hand out and going to the churches and asking, how do we move forward in a good way? How can we walk together? We gave the Pope, well, I shouldn't say we, I should say Mitch, gave the Pope some beautiful, beautiful moccasins for us to all walk together with. And I believe that we can all walk together in a good way, but we all have to hold each other up. So from my voice to your voice, from my heart to your heart, it's one heart, one mind, nothing about us without us. Hi, hi, miigwech, merci, and thank you all for listening. So you've already heard some very powerful Métis voices, and I would start by saying what a privilege it is uh, as, uh, as bishops to be able to uh, walk with our Métis people and to be a part of uh, the delegation and the visit with Pope Francis this morning. Uh, it was a, a very beautiful experience and a, a very much a, a privilege to be there. Uh, years of work have led up to uh, this delegation, these meetings, and uh, today we took a very big step. It's a significant moment, uh, but as the other speakers have mentioned, it's also a, a beginning of new possibilities in terms of walking together. What we wanted to create, what we heard from all three Indigenous groups, was the desire for people to be able to speak to the Pope directly, uh, to tell their stories, to speak of their experiences, of their suffering, uh, and in a particular way, the experiences at residential schools. And uh, for him to be able to hear that and then respond from the heart. So from the Pope's perspective today, it was principally about listening. And I think we had the experience of him listening very deeply and engaging on a very personal level uh, with what he heard. It was a beautiful thing that the gathering started with, uh, with the Métis prayer, uh, prayed by Elder Janvier in the language of Dene Michif. And uh, for us to be together, uh, church leaders and Métis peoples, and to have a, a Métis lead the prayer, a Métis elder lead the prayer, in his own language uh, was a beautiful, uh, beautiful moment to hear the testimonies of the, of the survivors and to hear the eloquent leadership coming from President Caron uh, was, it was a very impactful, uh, powerful morning. A lot of hard truths were spoken, but they were spoken in a very gracious and in a very poignant and in a very powerful way. As the other speakers have said, uh, there was an invitation extended, and there's a, such a strong desire to accept that invitation, uh, to walk together, uh, to find a way to walk together in a good way, uh, to really embrace that, that saying that Pixies just said that I quote often, nothing about us without us. We've heard that over and over again from our indigenous peoples. Um, it's a, uh, it's a day when we want to say, we desire to stand with you in your pursuit of justice. We des desire to be in solidarity with you on this journey. And uh, we're so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour. I am the French part of the, of the meal. So, um, I want to thank very much uh, all the delegates. And je veux remercier tous les délégués parce que c'est un grand it's déplacement. Because it's a, a big trip, and mostly at the end of these exchanges, I'd like to try and communicate with you the climate of these meetings that we had this morning, especially with the group of the Métis. Uh, oui, les trois témoignages the three qui testimonials ont été proposés, that were given and that we heard with the Holy Father were testimonies from heart to heart, and they were done in a climate, I would say, um, these, these are, this is my view, um, with affection, mutual affection, and it's quite difficult to describe. They were done with a lot of time, they were done 
done with breaks and they were done with actions as well. I remember the actions of the Holy Father who was welcoming these testimonials but also took the time to welcome the delegates with actions. The the people who were offered and this process simply to have the 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 right note for our meetings so the ones with the metis this morning it's this time that is given to us not for the principles we didn't fix big thing we didn't sign accords or anything we were heart to heart on experiences and this opened the door a wide open door and i believe i can say that it is on the side of the Métis and on the Holy Father's side, a big open door to be able to welcome each other and forgive each other and ask for forgiveness. I believe I can say this and I hope that we know that this meeting is in a, a period, a final period. It is a step in our, uh, in our walk together, but at the same time, and this is what I saw this morning, it is a look towards today and tomorrow. Yes, we need to be aware of the past. Yes, we need to take it into consideration. We need to recognize it. We need to be responsible for it, but we need to do it for today and tomorrow so that we do something much better together. And that's the expression that the Holy Father wanted to use himself at the end of the meeting by saying, in my prayer and also in my meditation to be able with you to, to deliver a message in the 1st of April, well, it will be the public uh, the public audience. Alors, merci beaucoup. So thank you very much. Merci, and thank you everyone for sharing your very personal remarks. Uh, we have a brief period of questions, uh, question period available. Erica has the mic here, so if you do have a question, we ask you to put up your hand. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We uh, will just limit it to one question, uh, just in the interest of time to try to get to as many people as possible. Please identify your media outlet and who you're directing your question to uh, when you ask it. So I think we had a hand right over here. Erica, second row here in the front. The microphone, is it working? Yep. Hi, I'm uh, Eric Regulli with the Globe and Mail. Uh, this is a question for anyone who feels like answering it, please. Um, obviously, you'd like an apology from the Pope. Um, or my sense is preferably in Canada than in Rome, but all apologies are not created equal. What I'd like to know is what specifically would you like the Pope to say in his apology? Thank you. So, based on uh, a number of conversations that I've been extremely fortunate to have with Métis residential schools, survivors from across the Métis homeland, you're absolutely right, an apology will be different and it will mean different things to many different people and, and many people are, are looking for something different in that apology. What I've heard though is, you know, if you look at the, the, the definition of an apology in, in, in the dictionary, it talks about an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And I think that's exactly what a lot of our survivors have told me, is that they're looking for that acknowledgement that they played, the Catholic Church, residential schools, played a role in the wrongdoing that was done to these children and to our communities. We know that intergenerational trauma is embedded in our DNA scientifically. It, the science has been done. It shows that we're passing this trauma on to generation to generation and that we need to start to heal. And so to acknowledge that the Catholic Church is accountable and responsible for some of that harm to not only our survivors who are still living today, but that they're responsible for the harms that our communities still suffer today that will play an important role in our healing. Will that give us closure? No. An apology is just words, and we then need action to follow that. And part of those actions I, I've spoken about in that we need action within truth, reconciliation, justice, and healing. And for truth, part of that will be providing unfettered access to church and residential school records so that we're able to piece together our history in a better way to know where our families were when their children were taken from them and where those children went to and went and 
which children didn't return home. We don't have access to all of those stories because those are, are protected within church records. So we want unfettered access to those records. We also want access to our cultural artifacts that are held here in Rome and at the Vatican. Those artifacts tell a story about our communities. Those are our history. In reconciliation, we talked about an apology and that acknowledgement. We've, we've heard from our survivors that many of them need that to move forward. In justice, some of those actions that we would be looking for is a commitment from the Catholic Church not to shield alleged perpetrators who still live regardless of their age. We know that perpetrators are still out there. Those who committed these crimes against our children are still living, and we need a commitment from the Catholic Church to not shield those alleged perpetrators. That's important. That's an action we're looking for. For healing, we need, as, as my colleague Mitch said, substantive and direct compensation for our survivors, many of whom live in poverty today. This has contributed to the systemic inequities that our people face today. Those of us are families who don't have a house, a roof over their head. And we need funding for community-based healing initiatives as directed by our survivors and our families to heal in the ways that we direct for ourselves. So of course an apology is really important and we need that, that acknowledgement, but we also seek action. And these are just a few of those examples that we're looking for. I, I, I wanna add, uh just one also, I think it, there's an important clarification and a distinction that needs to happen. There are, there are uh, I, say every, I say it all the time, everything is always more complicated than we think that it is. But there, there, I, I, if I were to answer your question, which is what I'm going to pretend to do right now, um, what... What an apology to me would have to look like in order for it to be meaningful. There needs to be a, a, sort of a multitude of things in there. And, and I, there, are, there are two different parts to it in, in my mind. There is uh, the, what are quite frankly horrific, absolutely horrific crimes that were committed. Physical, mental and sexual abuse against children that is absolutely revolting, that should, that should disgust anyone who has looked at what happened. And, and that is one of the issues. But had, that, had those things not gone on, that wouldn't have made residential schools okay. The idea, had, had children not been physically, mentally, and sexually abused, it wouldn't have meant that the attempted destruction of our culture and the racial erasure of our people from the earth would have been okay. The entire underpinning of the system, and, and, and I, don't, I don't care about, well, times have changed. There were people then who knew it was wrong. They spoke up and they were fired. So, so those are the two really important things, and I don't, and neither one of them is more important than the other. Those those crimes against those children have to be treated as such, and there should be a, 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 a accountability, a, a atonement, apology. Uh, I want a thesaurus of all the words that could be used there. But also, had those things never occurred, it still would have been wrong. So, okay. Second row right over here. Uh, Phil Pulella from Reuters here in Rome, um, knew Bishop Boland a long time ago. Um, I'd like to ask you, Bishop, um, perhaps the other bishop as well, but one of the two of you, could you explain, a lot has been said about where, about the records, access to the records, as Cassidy just said. Apart from the records of religious orders that ran the, the schools and apart from perhaps what is in Canada at the Bishop's Conference, there has been talk that there are records here in the Vatican. Where would they be? Would they be in Pokemon the Fide, CDF, or where, where would they be? We ask the question. On a demandé la question ici au Vatican en préparant la délégation. Il y a, euh, c'est la réponse, il n'y a pas 
de dossiers ici à Rome à propos des écoles résidentielles. Uh, the residential schools, I believe that can be understood. You know, the universal churches throughout the whole world. So institutions, schools, there are some around the world. So all those institutions do not send files to Rome. So the files are mostly um, within the hands of the religious communities that held the schools and maybe the government who is the owner of the schools. So as our throughout our work, we started wanting to open those files and we know that from the diocese, um, these are mostly files that we call uh, sacramental. So the sacraments that the children received in the schools. So there's not really much else. Now, there is work being done right now, and we are with, we are working with community, uh, religious communities to open up as much as possible any files there are to be able to share. So with the respect as well of what we call the existing laws in terms of privacy, we, we cannot divulge everything any way, any time, uh, but I think the work is being done. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to translate, I'm just going to add <laughs> to it. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, it would be religious communities that uh, might have records here in Rome, not the Vatican. Uh, and for instance, the Oblates have indicated their strong desire to be of, of assistance in whatever way they can. Um, I think requests for records come in multiple ways, and some of them have been referred to not only in responding to uh, individual requests for any information we would have that would communicate something of students who were at a particular school, uh, but also the desire of Métis communities to, to tell their story. So uh, everything that we would have that would assist in telling that story would be a helpful thing to contribute. So, I mean, I think this is, uh, th th there is a profound desire to assist in whatever way we can in this regard. Uh, and it, it's, it's conversations that need to have happen with particular religious communities or dioceses or any places where any pertinent records might be held. So. That's right. We have heard, you know, there are records in the CDF, which, by the right. way, why should it be there? Yeah. So in no dicastery, we're talking about mother houses of religious orders in Rome. That's, I understand where there might be records, yes. Okay, right over here. Yep, yeah. Erica, thank you. Hello, Lisa Laflamme from CTV National News. This question also for the bishop, uh, either bishop. <laughs> um, I think as recently as September, it was a promise of $30 million to help in the funding projects that are for reconciliation for the survivors, as Cassidy and Mitch mentioned. And I just wonder, as recently as December, there was not a penny seen. So where are we at on that front as far as the finances in that effort, as you say, it is a pledge to give the communities the money they need for these programs. And also a little more clarification, if we could, on the question of these documents. It's 2022. I mean, somebody knows where the documents are. And it seems strange to me that we're just learning today that none of them are in the Vatican archives. And I still don't really understand who's got the answer to that question. Alors, il y a deux questions. So there are two questions. So as for the records, the answer in the Vatican is there are no records in the archives about residential schools. Now we know where some records are. We said uh, religious communities who worked in the schools. Now we know very well that these days and for the past few years, 
our sensitivity is much greater on the question. So there were years where there was no sensitivity on the question for the public opinion. So these records were maybe not very much considered. They are more now. As for the 30 million fund, we wanted to build a structure that was completely transparent and independent from the conference and the diocese. Um, diocese. So the 30 million could really be there available with that structure to be available for projects. And there are right now, as we speak, a structure that is currently being built, a corporation. Um, there are currently directors and administrators that were chosen. Um, within the directors, um, these are people who are from the indigenous population who have good experience with management and, and business and financial management. And there's also administrators who are destined to name or f to find uh, other administrators. So it's an independent structure. The 30 million is a commitment from the dioceses. Uh, some of them are doing it from their own assets and others are doing it from um, some donations from um, people and we've calculated and we've come up with this number, maybe a little bit more, but it takes time because we do not want to repeat the mistake that there was during the first agreement. We really want a transparent structure that can um, show responsibility and accountability and when projects are accepted, they will be agreed upon, particularly with indigenous populations and communities. I would add that uh, dioceses across the country and, and eparchies have committed, uh, indicated what their commitment is to that 30 million so that it will be achieved. I can say that in Regina, we've had several initiatives already. So we had uh, an internet, uh, a place to make internet donations. We had a Pew collection. We have a capital campaign underway where we approached every contributor to the capital campaign asking if they would allocate part of that funding instead to this Truth and Reconciliation Fund. Uh, we uh, have other funds that we've allocated that way, so uh, we have already designated and, and have over one and a half million dollars. Uh, so I think that's happening in different dioceses and uh, we will fulfill that commitment. It's, it's moving forward uh, and we're working with uh, First Nation and Métis people in, in our area, for instance, in determining uh, survivor-led uh, initiatives so that we're building relationships uh, at the same time as we're, we're proceeding in this regard. So, Okay. Yep, go ahead. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm going to be following up with uh, Bishop Poisson to get the uh, translation of these answers afterwards about where the records are because I don't speak French, unfortunately. Um, I do just want to say, I, I know the initiatives that the Com Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops is undertaking, and, and they've launched the, the fundraiser to, uh, to support reconciliation actions, but I, I, I do need to say that the parishioners in the diocese who, who themselves are individually donating to, that's an act of reconciliation for those individuals, and there's a much larger role for the Canadian Cat Conference of Catholic Bishops to play in helping us advocate to the Pope and to the Vatican, one of the wealthiest states in this world. There should be no question why these funds have not been paid to our people yet. Okay, we have time for one last question, just over here. Test. Wajek, my name is Christine. I'm from uh, Quebec, and I'm here to cover the story in my language, in Cree. So I report back to my people. So for the Métis delegation, um, my, uh, my honor to you. And uh, my question is in terms of the, um, the funding that comes in, you know, the, for residential school and also for the future generation. Um, We've run into problems um, asking, requesting for that funding, applying for the funding, the Indian Day School, uh, the 60s school. So um, we run into problems telling us that we're not eligible. 
we're not eligible for that funding. I don't understand. It does. It's it's understand. I don't understand that. And the people that do get approved, they're dictated on how they can spend that money. You know, we say uh, we want to do it for our healing. We invest in our own because I'm happy that we're doing that. And is it the same thing for for you guys, the, the Métis? Do you run into that issue too as well, where you're being rejected, your applications are being rejected, or it's not coming in? They they ask all kinds of questions. They need proof. Some of these proofs are long gone, and we we don't have access to them. Is that what you're running to as well for uh, for the Métis? Miigwech. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, I'll say there, there is nothing I love more than a microphone and an audience. So let me let me say, uh, I, I, one of the things, and to Lisa's question also, from from a Métis perspective, one of the things that we encounter all the time is there are these huge announcements of funds, and then if you read this, the little text underneath, Métis aren't included, and 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 so. Uh, the, the bishops, you know, uh, if 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 we start hearing that Métis aren't included in that, uh, you're going to hear from me. So, uh, you know, let's avoid that. Let's get this right from the start. Um, you know, but one of the other comments that I would make to that question is uh, the what what I you know I, has been said by many much smarter people than I. The the invention of the reconciliation industry in Canada, where our people continue to live in poverty. Our con people continue to live without. Our people, uh, you know, uh, continue to, you know, we, we, we sell Indian tacos at, the, at our community centers to try to pay for basic needs of people. And yet every university in this country has received, uh, not this country, not, not uh, our back home, uh, they've received countless dollars to, for their reconciliation. Uh, and all of that, uh, you know, sort of re, re, uh, repurposing those dollars uh, back into funding what are, quite frankly, sometimes failing institutions. Uh, and that uh, that reconciliation industry, we we gotta we gotta stop that right now. And we've got to put that those resources into communities, into the hands of communities, into the hands of community-driven, community-led, and survivor-led uh, work. And and uh, you know anything other than that is is quite frankly unacceptable. So. Um, I, I first and foremost want to thank you for being here and for telling this story in, in one of our indigenous languages. Many of our, our Métis people speak Cree, and I, so I thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and, and thank you for, for being the last one to ask a question. Um, on that piece as well, one of the, the asks that we will be putting forward to the Holy Father is uh, for the establishment of a Métis Reconciliation Trust Fund uh, to fund Métis-specific truth, reconciliation, justice, and healing initiatives that is directed by Métis people because this is one of the, the challenges that we have come up uh, across. Um, I want to close uh, by sharing some, some reflections and, uh, and this comes from, again, spending countless hours with, with residential school survivors over the past few months. Residential schools, and when we talk about residential schools within the Métis context, it also includes boarding schools, day schools, industrial schools, convents, all which sought to take love away from our people. It took children out of their homes and deprived them of love. It taught them that they were not to love who they are as Métis people, our children came home hating who they were, hating their language, hating their culture, hating their tradition. They had no love. But our survivors are so resilient, and they're learning to love. And that's one of the things that our survivors tell us all the time. And it's so important to stand up here today and, and to tell you that we are still here. We still have our culture, though we still have a lot of work to do in the revitalization of our language. We are doing that work. We love who we are. We love our history. We love our culture. We love our language. We love our people. And we are still here and we will continue to fight so that our future generations love themselves too. So thank you so much, everyone. I, I, I just I want to add to that. that and uh, partly in a... In, in a, in a, in a I, one of my sisters just texted me, and my nieces and nephews are watching at home. And I, and I just, um, you know, for Thomas and Zig and Anman and Wasse Avendor at home, I, I, see, I see how proud they are of who they are 
uh, as these, these little indigenous kids who, who are learning their language. And my, my, my niece and my nephew, they can count in, in the language. And, and, I, and I just think about the way that, that so many of our grandparents never got that opportunity. And, and the way my grandpa, when I was a kid, he taught me how to count to five in Ojibwe. But that is literally all his grandmother taught him. Because she refused to teach them the language. But she refused. She wouldn't teach them. They all, it's all they got. One to five. And, and I just think about those kids and, and that, those, those, those kids that had these horrible things done to them. But I, trying as best as I'm always encouraged by our national president to, to be positive and to be hopeful and to be kind. Uh, when quite frankly, I want to get really mad, quite frankly. Uh, but uh, but she calls us to be better than that. And uh, I just I think about not just those kids who suffered, but those kids who are coming. And um, our, our, my, our support over here, Tara, her, her little kids are watching us from home. And, and that, that, that's what really, uh, all of the, with all due respect, the pomp and circumstance of all of this, uh, that's what this is all about, is those little kids. And so when we go home, that's what we're going to work for. We're going to work to make the world a little bit better for all those little Métis kids at home. And, and I guess I would just ask others to help, help us, help us with that. So thank you. A final word from Pixie. I'd just like to say one last thing. I, um, I'm not sure if any of you know the song or have heard of Andrea Menard, but she sings a song called Wisa Katoanak. And what that means is, you know, the roots coming up after a fire has gone through. So today we sit here and hopefully we're bringing new roots to our children and to the generations coming after us and for our survivors. So Wisa Katoanak, and I also like to ask you all, and you know, I know this is a small portion and a small point, the Métis rose or the Métis flower is called the forget-me-not. So when you go home and you plant something in your garden this year, please plant a forget-me-not. And every time you look at that, remember the Métis people because that's who we are. Do not forget us. Forget-me-not. Merci, Megwitch. President Caron, Mitch, Pixie, Archbishop Bolin, Monsignor Poisson, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, you'll have a chance throughout the week if you'd like to set up time to, to talk to any of the delegates or the bishops. I know that they've made themselves quite available. Uh, we will have our next briefing. It may be a little bit after 4 o'clock. We'll just uh, have the Inuit uh, representatives that will be part of that briefing. But feel free to stay if you are here. And again, we thank the Métis delegates for sharing their stories with us today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>